Now, in exploring how financial innovation can help create a more sustainable future, it is also critical that fintech look at its own emissions, the energy and water impact of data storage, as well as data processing. How do we decarbonize payment and data systems? To find out, let's please welcome on stage Hamza Samad, who's project lead leader, payments in Web3 at Boston Consulting Group. Hello, everyone. Really pleased to be here today. We're here to discuss the decarbonization of payment and data systems. You may be forgiven for perhaps not appreciating actually the significant contribution this is having in the broader discussion around decarbonization, uh, impact on carbon, power consumption. But the area of payments is fascinating, right? Um, all of us are retail consumers. Uh, the penetration of digital payments is impacting our daily lives. And we see year by year in the UK and globally, um, digital payment methods are increasing. So we're going to look at the impact this is having under the hood, right? This ecosystem is powered by infrastructure that enables digital payments. There are vast implications on data storage, on cooling, on power, and so on. We have a great panel here to discuss some of the key issues. Um, we'll do some introductions, and then we'll focus on some of the key issues and, and hear hopefully a multifaceted um, perspectives on, on some of the key areas here. So, Simon, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you. Um, Simon Rendell, I'm, I'm not actually the uh, product manager for electronic payments in Lord's Banking Group. Uh, I had to pay business architects function, but I do look after payments. Uh, I'm Emma Kisby. I am the CEO for EMEA of Kogo. Uh, we translate payment information and we match it with emissions factor to create personalised carbon footprints for individuals and small businesses. Uh, I'm Alex Graben. I'm one of the founders of a company called The Data City. We map the emerging economy. Um, both for the financial services sector um, and for the government. Great, thank you. And I'm Hamza Samad, uh, project leader, Boston Consulting Group, focus heavily on payments and areas around technology and fintech more broadly. It's great that we have a kind of varied set of perspectives here. Let's just set the scene somewhat, right? And then we can get your kind of specific takes here. When we think about payments in the UK, just looking at retail, we hit 1.2 trillion in payment value last year. And as I was alluding to earlier, right, under the hood, there is a vast network of infrastructure, of PSPs, of card networks, of financial institutions, providing the pipes, the rails to, to ensure that our payments get to where they need to get. Because the penetration of digital payments has been so high over the last couple of years, power consumption, the carbon impact of that is, is not often such a well studied area relative to areas like airlines and car manufacturing elsewhere. To shine a light on some of the key issues, our panelists will provide a perspective both from a, I think, consumer perspective. How does this affect all of us? What are the kind of actions we can take on a day-to-day -day basis? From a kind of business, infrastructure, government perspective, how can we structurally try to address this uh, problem before it potentially becomes uh, even broader, and also from a, a financial institutions perspective as well, right? Serving businesses and customers, and also looking at the impact of their own emissions. How do we kind of address that? Emma, I, I'd, I'd love to start with you and get your view on, from a consumer perspective, why does this matter? And practically, what can consumers start to do and evaluate in their kind of everyday lives? Yeah, thanks, Hamza. Um, there's been a kind of running theme throughout today around the kind of need for macroeconomic shift and consumers play a massive part of that. You know, the latest IPCC report actually states that 70% of greenhouse gases are linked to household consumption. But the challenge is, quite simply, there's an intention and action gap. And individuals just don't know, it's bloody complicated, right? And you don't necessarily think about the impact of your everyday spend. And the question we hear is actually, does it make a difference what I'm spending on? There's a really interesting data point that came out of the pandemic. One, I can't homeschool, <laughs> and it was very traumatic. But the other thing was, for the first year of the pandemic, when we all stopped and stopped spending, global emissions went down by 7%. So we can have a collective impact. And the problem, again, with that intention action game is how do you keep that front of mind? And that's where the payment data is so powerful. So we match emission factors with payment information, and we create personalized carbon footprint trackers. And We've done that as a fintech business, but we realized to create scale and impact, we need to collaborate with banks. So we work with 20 banks worldwide, 
and we surface this through their mobile banking experience. So banks like NatWest, who have a reach of 8 million customers, and ING, who have a reach of 5 million customers. And we help people really understand the impact of their spend, see their carbon hotspots, if you like, and then give them personalized climate action plans to help them reduce, and then give them feedback to show both the carbon savings and also the cost savings that they can achieve. That, that's really interesting. And you know, over the last two to three years, I mean, this issue has really gained ascendancy, right, on the consumer side, on the business side. I mean, how have you, in your experience, noticed the kind of traction in the market, as well as with consumers? Yeah, I think when we kind of started approaching, especially banks, four years ago, yeah. it was kind of a nice to see, you know, that kind of ESG off the side of the desk kind of thing. But actually, what, what we're seeing, and even we were working recently with ING, they said that they've actually seen a lot of their their customers, especially a younger cohort, actually saying, look, we're going to leave the bank unless we really see genuine ESG action. Now, we sometimes get criticized for working with the banks because it's like, well, hang on, aren't they the ones causing the problems? But actually, by creating this carbon tracker and actually driving engagement, we can provide really useful data and insights to the banks to signal that people are really engaged. And a while back, so we've grown a lot since then, NatWest published that we've got half a million customers engaging with the carbon footprint tracker. That's grown significantly. I can't disclose, but... <laughs> But there's a lot more appetite and a real need because people are getting a bit desperate because it's, yeah. it's not looking great. Yeah. I think one thing that's really interesting for me is, is that the fintech guy inside me, personalization and kind of data analytics, right? We often hear that in the context of loyalty, of marketing. It's almost becoming a, a table stakes capability, right? I think it's really fascinating that you are kind of taking that same technology but deploying it within a kind of green decarbonization context. I mean, can you talk just a little bit around the capabilities that you need to kind of enable that, that kind of carbon uh, tracking technology? Yeah, so quite a while ago, I helped set up a business for a big UK grocer, and it was using data and behavioral science to drive about 100 million to their bottom line. It, it's bloody powerful, right? We, we're all very influenceable, uh, me included. Things pop up, you know, you get served these amazing deals you can't help but buy. We got very good at getting people to buy more stuff. Actually, we can use all those techniques, the behavioral science, the algorithm, propensity models, to actually help people to be more sustainable and more conscious in their consumption. That's proven. We can see that. We can see that in big online retailers like Amazon. They're popping up all the time. Actually, we just need to shift that and use exactly those techniques to actually influence consumer behavior too, me included. That's fascinating. It's like deploying loyalty capabilities almost in a in different context. Awesome. Alex, I'd, I'd love to, to go to you next, right? I think in your work, you're able to provide a, a kind of a, an interesting structural view of um, you know, the system from a broader perspective um, the implications on, on data storage, for example. Can you, can you help us understand how bad is it? Yeah, so I brought a few stats in preparation for this, uh, but I wanted to <laughs> make sure I get them right. So uh, UK data centers account for about 3.7%, um, sorry, global data centers account for 3.7% of CO2 emissions, but wow. the UK is ahead of the curve with about 9% and they, account, they consume about 20% of all energy generation. So that's, that's a lot, right? It's a very high proportion. Um, it's forecast to exceed 14% of global emissions by 2040. And the sort of, the, the way I came into that world was we did a work, piece of work mapping the net zero economy as like a supply chain. Sure. And um, looking at energy generation through to storage um, and then submitting tenders to larger institutions, the government, and having to write our own commitments to net zero. Yep. And that leads you into this sort of space where you, you know, we're a fintech, govtech company. You, you think you're quite carbon light. And I think sort of it's a bit out of sight, out of mind. The factory is in the data center somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and then we actually looked at the carbon in, uh, you know, our actual carbon footprint in the data center. And we're relatively light. You know, transactionally, we have very large storage, but um, the sort of transactional compute overhead sometimes is extreme, but not constantly always on. If you think about some of the data centers around here and what they're doing, the, the energy consumption and the CO2 um, impacts of those is really significant. Okay, so can then, I, Can I just ask on. you on that? I mean, what, what are the two, three kind of big drivers of that very significant kind of a, a emission level, right? Because yeah. you have the need for cooling in yeah. a big way, right? So, so the explosion of AI has driven compute yeah. So, and that drives a huge energy consumption and a huge heat output. So you've got um, Microsoft are experimenting with putting data centers in containers at the bottom of the sea 
Um, I don't know if you've seen, there's been an announcement uh, this week where they've actually announced they're going to build their own nuclear reactors and yep. to power their data centers to cope with the AI application um, requirements. So there's a lot of, well, and then when you think about what that means, so if we're, if we're serious about meeting net zero, what we need to do is decarbonize our, our data centers. We've got yep. to deal with the heat and we've got to deal with the energy consumption. And actually that's, you know, no one's going to build a nuclear power plant here. So infrastructurally, yeah. you've got to think like, what does the proximity of the power generation to the data center look like? Right. You know, um, and that's when you look at the, the sort of national grid and the actual you know, internet infrastructure, uh, how closely matched and how that's all going to work. Is, I think it's quite a big infrastructural challenge for the UK. Well, everywhere, right? Might be a bit easier in America where they've got uh, a bit more land. Sure, sure. No, that, that's really interesting. I mean, so your work at, at the Data City, you're kind of looking at these kinds of issues. I infrastructure is an, an important one, I guess, also a challenging one to, to kind of address particularly yeah, in a short to medium. And there's a huge amount of innovation. You've got you know, all sorts of, I mean, it's battery storage, all of the renewable energy generation, hydrogen, nuclear, all of these things. You know, before I came here, I asked what we are doing about it, and apparently we have moved to an ISP who's located our servers next to French nuclear power stations right we're waiting for the they say this we're waiting for the, the proof but that's you know that's the way that we've sort of started taking this on board and that should drive I think a lot of us mm -hmm. to think seriously about you know which ISPs we use where we locate our data centers understood and Simon let let me bring you in here as well because you know it's you have an interesting viewpoint on this you know from a kind of financial institution perspective I guess there's a kind of a dual perspective one is you know, just the sheer scale of the organization, you know, consciousness of your own emissions and kind of uh, impact there. But also, I mean, you're serving, you know, one of the biggest banks in the UK. Um, you're serving a broad swathe of consumers, of businesses, right? Um, you know, how do you start to think about the, the bank's role, both from a kind of consumer and business customer perspective, but also looking at your own, you know, business infrastructure payment systems? Okay, so, I think if you think about how we help our customers understand their carbon footprint, um, I mean, Emma's, Emma's actually covered it really well for, for the consumer book. So a lot of that is about, in the UK, it's mainly about understanding what people are spending money on, and that's mainly about understanding uh, debit card transactions. Really. Yep. Um, it's a bit different for the business uh, sector, so that's more about um, other types of payments and wh what we can, I think we're, we're just starting to think about how we can do more in that space. but. Um, where I think we'll see real opportunity is in more data coming through in terms of how we service those payments and allowing those, those businesses to understand their supply chain better and therefore be able to understand their carbon footprint in there and be able to do their reporting as well associated with it. Um, there is a trade-off in that, which is with more data uh, comes more carbon footprint in, in and of itself. So, you know, we'll have to be careful, careful about how we, how we manage that. Um, I think the other part of it in, in terms and the bit that I've been kind of more focused on in the, in the day to day is um, so Lloyd's, it, Lloyd's is one of the organizations that I think Justin from Google referenced earlier on. We've got uh, net zero commitments, um, one of which is net zero operations by 2030. Sure. And um, what we, we decided to do in the payments part of the business was trying to think about actually what was the, what was the carbon footprint associated with payments for, for our banking group. Um, I'd love to understand how you went about that. It, it, it doesn't seem... It was, yeah, I mean, we, we started quite granular, actually. You just have to, you have to go right, right, kind of right down to the, the root of the customer journeys, really. Um, yep. And we tried to, um, we looked at it fair, like, fairly end-to-end. -end. We tried to be fairly uh, broad in how we thought about it, not necessarily, we didn't worry too much about whether it tied into what we were reporting, for example, but we just wanted to understand it so we could then... Um, so we could work out what actions we could take. And, and, and what it told us was that, um, you know, it's actually not surprising when you think about it, but most people wouldn't probably have thought about it. A about 96% of that was related to cash and checks and physical kind of processing. 96%? Yeah. Um, which when you think, um, and, and you know, most of the people in this room probably barely use cash, probably never seen a check or can't remember the last time they saw one. Um, there's 129 million checks were processed last year in, in the UK. Um, but does that mean that, because you know, we know that one of the drivers of the kind of uptick in, in kind of 
payment and data system emissions. There's also the penetration of digital payments, right? Just the, yeah. the new load of data that creates. But on the other hand, you're saying from, from your perspective, actually, you know, physical cash checks is, is a kind of a big overhead for you guys as well and your impact. Yeah, it's a kind of dual-sided problem there, right? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a, it's a big carbon cost to us, but it's also a big, like, pound, trillion, and pence cost as well, right? So yeah. it costs a lot of money to do the, to do the servicing for... For, for both things, for cash and checks, and they, you know, they're both declining. Um, so, so checks, as I said, 129 million last year, but declining quickly. Um, and actually, it looks, I looked it up, it looks as if it's just passing open banking. So, open banking is obviously increasing massively, yeah, in a big way. but it's about the same volume at the moment. So, it gives you a bit of an idea. Um, so, for us, then it becomes about if we want to address that, we need to think about uh, how do we help our customers to digitize more quickly. Yeah. Um, which is not as easy as you'd think it would be. I mean, natu it's happening naturally anyway. Yeah. The, the macro trends would support that, right? I think yeah. last year at, at the POS, uh, I think cash was like 10% of overall payment methods. Similar story across Europe, across yeah. the US. So that seems to be the, the direction of travel. Y yeah, that's right. So we're, we, you know, it's kind of pushing it an open door, but we still have a, you know, if you think of ESG in its broadest sense, the customers who, are, who, who have most difficulty using digital payments are yeah, the most vulnerable customers and the most vulnerable people in society. So we have to think very carefully about that. Um, and also what we're looking at is how can we you know, address aspects of the physical journey and digitize some of that. So can we, um, you know, can we make better use of imaging all the way across checks, for example? Can we, um, is there anything we can do to reduce the number of journeys that we do to pick up and drop cash in big armored cars? Yeah, it would be good to get, to get your guys' views views on that as well, right? Because we're seeing a, a big rise in obviously mobile channels, digital wallets in a big way, super apps that can kind of do everything, right? Um, how, how important do you think that will, you know, the role that will play kind of in the future to kind of reach the customer and grow consciousness? We had a real experience of this. We got paid by a local authority by check last week. Right. And, <laughs> and our bank wouldn't allow us to digitally scan the check to pay it in. So we had to go and physically to the bank for the first time ever. Uh, Who'd you bank with? In. Yeah, it was Barclays. No, <laughs> so it's safe. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's not just the digitally excluded. Yeah. We've, we've got large, it's a very large council. It's one of the largest in the UK that paid us. So presumably they're paying all their suppliers that way. And when we spoke to them about it, they said the internal processes involved in putting us on a digital payment system were too onerous and we won't get paid for six months or would you like a check <laughs> so there's some institutional level stuff yeah, to do, I think. yeah. but at the least if we could have scanned it and uploaded it that would have been half the journey right yeah but yeah awesome so so I guess I think time is against us just to kind of start start wrapping up right from our various kind of vantage points kind of introduce you guys all to kind of give your kind of you know two three kind of takeaways from your perspectives S Simon do you want to kick off uh, yeah, so I, I think, how do we decarbonize? Well, I, I think we've talked about helping our customers understand their, their impact on the world um, is really, really important as part of that, and, and data's key to that. It's how we manage that and how we surface it in, in the way that can really help. Thanks, and Emma, from your perspective? Well, Simon, I'd furiously agree, clearly. I think the power of digital payments is the fact it brings greater transparency to the impact of people's spend. And I think what's interesting as more and more businesses are forced to report, then we see more and more transparency in the supply chain and people can get more clarity on where their spend's going. So it's absolutely critical that we really all have an understanding of the impact of our everyday spend and become more conscious on the way we consume. Thank you, and Alex. I would uh, proactively procure your data center provider on the basis of their um, adoption of green energy to power their, uh, you know, and there's find those data providers that are first movers into this space because there's quite a lot of interesting innovation going on there. Use your money to actually, you know, let the market drive it. Awesome. Well, let me thank you all for sharing your viewpoints today. Uh, appreciate your, your time and listening to us. Uh, I hope you have an awesome rest of the conference. Thank you.